OK, so we know that the sum of x to the k over k factorial gives us e to the x. We're going to be interested in taking the sum of all of these terms, but only including certain ones. So for example, if we just include the zeroth term, the second term, the fourth term, and so on, so all of the even terms, what do we get when we take this sum? And similarly, what about all of the odd ones? So the first, the third, the fifth, and so on. We'll also look at taking every fourth term and then also taking the sum of every nth term briefly at the end to see how this generalizes. So you may actually recognise the sum of every even term as a familiar power series, but there's a really neat little argument that we can use to explain where this comes from. So the idea here is there's a little trick we can use which helps us to just look at the even terms and get rid of all of the odd terms in our summation. So we start by writing out e to the x, just longhand as 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 factorial plus x cubed over 3 factorial and so on. And then if we compare this with e to the negative x, this is 1 minus x plus negative x squared just gives us a positive x squared over 2 factorial, then minus x cubed over 3 factorial, and so on. So you can see if we add these two together, what are we going to get? e to the x plus e to the negative x, we get two lots of 1, and then our x and negative x cancel out. So we get rid of all of our odd terms, and the x cubed terms will cancel out as well. But we've still got two lots of x squared over 2 factorial, and we'll have two lots of x to the 4 over 4 factorial, and so on. So you can see that this gives us twice what we want here, our sum of all of the even terms. So just dividing by 2 then, you can see that the sum of all of our even terms, the sum from k equals 0 to infinity of x to the 2k, over 2k or factorial, this is just going to be equal to a half times e to the x plus e to the negative x. So e to the x plus e to the negative x over 2. And you may recognise this as the exponential form of hyperbolic cosine. So we can write this as hyperbolic cosine of x. So we can use the similar argument now for the sum of all of the odd terms. So instead of adding these two together, instead of adding e to the x and e to the negative x, we could try subtracting one from the other. So if we take e to the x minus e to the negative x, what do we get? We have 1 minus 1, just cancels and gives us 0. We have x minus negative x, we've got two lots of x. Then our x squared terms, all of our even powers are just going to cancel out when we subtract one from the other. And our x cubed over 3 factorial minus negative x cubed over 3 factorial gives us two lots of x cubed over 3 factorial, then we'd have two lots of x to the 5 over 5 factorial, and so on. So just like before, if we divide by 2 now, you can see that the sum from k equals 0 to infinity of, we'll write this as x to the 2k plus 1 over 2k plus 1 all factorial, this is just going to be equal to a half e to the x minus e to the negative x, which you may recognise as hyperbolic sine of x. So now we'll look at finding every fourth term in this sequence. So we're interested in having the zeroth term plus the fourth plus the eighth and so on. And here we could use a similar trick to before to get rid of our odd powers, but then we also need to get rid of the powers of 2 and the powers of 6, etc, so that we're just left with powers that are multiples of 4. And later we'll do multiples of 4 plus 1 plus 2 and plus 3. So there's another neat trick that we can use here where we can have e to the x and e to the negative x, this will help us get rid of the odd powers. But if we want to get rid of powers of 2, powers of 6, etc, we can actually look at e to the i times x. So e to the i x, and we'll also look at e to the negative i x. So e to the i x gives us 1 plus i times x, then plus i squared times x squared, so it gives us a negative x squared over 2 factorial then we take away i times x cubed over 3 factorial, then when we multiply by another i, we get plus x to the 4 over 4 factorial. So i is particularly useful here, e to the i x, essentially because this repeats every four times we multiply it together. So the underlying structure here is that i is a fourth root of unity, but we'll see how this fits into the more general picture later on. So we compare e to the i x to e to the negative i x, we still have 1, but then we have minus i times x. So you can see these two, if we add together, 
we can cancel out the ix and the negative ix. Then when we multiply by another negative i, we'll get negative x squared over 2 factorial. So you've got negative i times negative i gives you negative 1. Then when we multiply by another negative i, we get plus i times x cubed over 3 factorial. Then multiplying by another negative i, you get minus 1 times minus 1, so plus x to the 4 over 4 factorial, and so on. So here we can have a look at adding together all four of these terms, and we'll see what we get. This is really very beautiful. You get e to the x plus e to the negative x plus e to the ix plus e to the negative ix. First of all, we have 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1, so we just get four lots of 1. Then you can see our x to the power of 1 terms. These two cancel, and our ix and our negative ix cancel. Then we go on to x squared. We've got two lots of x squared over 2 factorial. We've also got two negative ones of this, so these will cancel out as well. Then we move on to our powers of 3. These two cancel in pairs, but our negative ix cubed and our positive ix cubed also cancel, so there's no x cubed term there either. Then when we move on to x to the power of 4, we've just got four lots of positive x to the 4 over 4 factorial. So this is exactly what we're looking for, 1 plus x to the 4 over 4 factorial. Then you can check that our powers of 5, 6, and 7 would all cancel out, just like we've seen with the i's and with the two positives and two negatives for our power of 6 there. But in the end, we end up just adding x to the 8 over 8 factorial, and then x to the 12 over 12 factorial and so on. So this is actually four times the sequence that we're interested in, is this e to the x plus e to the negative x plus e to the ix plus e to the negative ix. So we can conclude then that our sum from k equals naught to infinity of x to the 4k over 4k factorial, this is the one that we're interested in, this is going to be equal to a quarter times the sum of all these, so a quarter e to the x plus e to the negative x, plus e to the ix, plus e to the negative ix. But once again, we can use the e to the x plus e to the negative x over 2, that's hyperbolic cos. And we can also take out a factor of a half here, which gives us e to the x plus e to the negative x over 2 is hyperbolic cos. But then also e to the ix plus e to the negative ix over 2, you may recognise as the exponential form of cos of x. So in the end, this is all just equal to a half hyperbolic cos of x plus regular cos of x. Now for the remaining three series that we're interested in evaluating, we could try adding and subtracting different combinations of e to the x, e to the minus x, e to the ix, and e to the minus ix. But I find it's actually simpler if we take the result that we do know, and then we're going to differentiate this series term by term. So in general, differentiating an infinite series term by term isn't something that we're always allowed to do, but here we're not going to go into the details, I'll include a link in the description for if you're interested, but here we can take for granted that we can differentiate this term by term. So we're interested in the derivative with respect to x of our sequence where we've just found the result, so the sum from k equals naught to infinity of x to the 4k over 4k factorial. If we just write this out term by term, it's the derivative of 1 plus x to the 4 over 4 factorial plus x to the 8 over 8 factorial, and so on. So you can see when we differentiate this, differentiate the 1, that just gives us 0, and when we differentiate x to the 4 over 4 factorial, the extra 4 we get cancels out with one of the 4s in the denominator, so we get x cubed over 3 factorial, and similarly here we multiply by 8, so the denominator now is just 7 factorial, we've got x to the power of 7, and so on. Similarly, you'd get x to the 12 over 12 factorial would differentiate to give x to the 11 over 11 factorial. So you can see this is actually the one at the bottom here, x to the 4k plus 3. So the sum from k equals naught to infinity of x to the 4k plus 3 over 4k plus 3, all factorial, is equal to the derivative of a half hyperbolic cos x plus cos x, don't forget. So using the result that we've already derived there, we can say that this is then going to be equal to the derivative of a half hyperbolic cos x plus 
regular cars of x. So then we know that the derivative of hyperbolic cars is just hyperbolic sine x, and the derivative of cos x is negative sine x, so we take away sine x there. So we've now evaluated the series at the bottom there, all of our x to the 4k plus 3 over 4k plus 3 factorial ones. So now we can use the same trick, we can differentiate again to get the results for each of these. So our sum to infinity of x to the 4k plus 2 is just what we get when we differentiate the x to the 4k plus 3 terms. So this is the derivative of this sequence, which we know is going to be then the derivative of a half hyperbolic sine x minus regular sine x. So then the derivative of hyperbolic sine, we just get hyperbolic cos, and the derivative of negative sine x, we get negative, so we take away cos x. So this is the formula now for our second one, x to the 4k plus 2 over 4k plus 2 factorial. And then finally, if we want to work out x to the 4k plus 1, we know that the sum to infinity of x to the 4k plus 1 over 4k plus 1 factorial, so every fourth term where we add 1, we know that this is going to be the derivative of our expression for x to the 4k plus 2 over 4k plus, that should be a 2 factorial. So we know that this is just the derivative of a half hyperbolic cos minus cos of x, so we get a half hyperbolic sine x plus regular sine of x. So then we've evaluated all four of these subsequences, the sum along each of these. And now we'll finish off by looking at the more general picture. So what happens if we take the sum of every nth term? So here we'll take the sum of the zeroth term plus the nth term plus the two nth term and so on. So the idea here is we start with e to the x, but then we're also going to consider using roots of unity e to the omega x, then e to the omega squared x, e to the omega cubed times x, and so on. So here we're taking omega to be the nth root of unity, so omega is e to the 2 pi i over n, our first root of unity, so that omega to the power of n is equal to 1. And we'll see in a sec why this is useful. So just expanding this out, we have 1 plus omega x plus omega squared times x squared over 2 factorial, and so on, up to omega to the n times x to the n over n factorial, and so on. But here don't forget that omega to the power of n, because this is an nth root of unity, is just going to be equal to 1. So here we're going to try and keep our x to the n over n factorial term, and hopefully we can get rid of our x, x squared, x cubed terms, etc. So the idea is then we'll look at e to the omega squared times x, e to the omega cubed times x, all the way up to e to the omega to the n minus 1 times x, which gives us 1 plus omega to the n minus 1 x plus, and it's omega to the 2 n minus 1 times x squared over 2 factorial, and so on, up to omega to the n minus 1 times n, times x to the n over n factorial, and so I'm just substituting omega to the n minus 1 x into our formula for the exponential function here. So then you can see that omega to the n minus 1 times n, this is just 1 to the power of n minus 1, rearranging the index there. So this is actually also just equal to 1. So you can see all of our x to the n over n factorial terms, it looks like we're going to keep these. But how do we know that when we add all of these together, we're going to be able to get rid of our x terms, our x squared terms. So there's a result about complex numbers here. If we look at our coefficients of x, we've got 1 plus omega plus omega squared, and so on, up to plus omega to the n minus 1. And it turns out that this, for nth roots, is always going to be equal to 0. So I won't prove this here, but I'll include a link in the description if you're interested. And similarly, if we look at our coefficients of x squared, we've got 1 plus omega squared, plus omega to the 4, and so on, all the way up to omega to the 2 times m minus 1. And it turns out that this is also always going to be equal to 0, and so on for 1 plus omega cubed for our x cubed terms, and so on. So all of these terms, when we add them all together, are going to cancel out. 
you can check if you're interested there. So this tells us then if we take e to the x plus e to the omega x and so on up to e to the omega to the n minus 1 times x, what are we going to get there? We'll have n lots of 1, but then all of our terms in between x to the 1 and x to the n minus 1, these terms all just disappear when we add them together. We get 0, but we're still left with n lots of x to the n over n factorial. Then similarly, our n plus 1 terms, our n plus 2 terms will all cancel when we add them using the property of the sums of roots of unity. So then we're just left with the same thing will happen x to the 2n over 2n, or factorial, and so on. So just rearranging here and dividing by n, we can conclude that the sum we're interested in, the sum from k equals 0 to infinity of x to the nk over nk, or factorial then, this is equal to 1 over n, and then we'll write this sum as, we'll say it's the sum from m equals 0 up to n minus 1 of e to the omega to the m times x. So this is our result where we take the sum of every nth term, and similarly we could differentiate this term by term to find all of the other corresponding ones with a gap of size n.